This is a part of our Writers, Speakers, and Ideas series. And usually this is, these are uh, talks that are held on our campus, of course, this semester and last semester during COVID. Uh, these are talks that are held virtually. And uh, I believe over the course of the year, we've reached about 1,000 students, uh, well over, excuse me, almost 1,500 students with these talks, which I think is quite remarkable. We're very proud of that. And you can see our beautiful campus there in the upper right hand corner of that slide. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be, and I'm sure we will eventually be having these in person again. Uh, our series is premised on the idea that talking about books is important educationally as the books and subjects themselves. And today we have uh, the Houston Chronicle reporter, uh, Joe Holly, with us to discuss his book, Sutherland Springs, God, Guns and Hope in a Texas Town. More on Joe in just a bit. Uh, so the way this is going to work today, it's really very simple. Uh, we've already introduced the series and then Joe will speak for somewhere around 30 to 40 minutes, I suppose. And as he's speaking, here are some key questions to be thinking about as he talks. Uh, first of all, how did he first hear of the Sutherland uh, spring shootings and why did he decide to cover it? You know, uh, and what are some of the pluses and minuses of uh, writing this kind of book? And I should say this is a picture of the book, Sutherland Springs, God, Guns and Hope in a Texas Town. Another question, what aspects of Texas history in the 19th century uh, reflect the importance of God's and God and guns in the state today? Uh, what are some of the major theological beliefs of the members of the Sutherland Springs Church? How might, the, how might they answer the question of how a just God could allow such a tragedy to happen? Of all the characters Joe Holly talks about in this story, which was the most interesting to you or the most important? And then think about why. And does Joe Holly have realistic hope that what he calls what he calls Texas and gun insanity can ever stop? During the talk, you can think about these questions and you can ask any questions you want by typing them into the chat. And as you do so, I will, those will come to me and then I will send them out to the uh, audience at large. And then when Joe is done talking after the talk is over, we'll have a question and answer period for about 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, without any further ado, uh, we're going to, I'm gonna introduce Joe, native Texan Joe Holly. He's a former edit editorial page writer and columnist for newspapers in both San Antonio and San Diego. He's been a staff writer for the Washington Post. He's a regular contributor to Texas Monthly and Columbia Journalism Review. And he's the author of two books, and I think actually more than that now, uh, including God, Guns and Hope in a Texas Town. He joined the Houston Chronicle in 2009. And on that note, I'm gonna stop sharing. And Joe, the floor is yours. It's all you. Very good. Thank you, John. Thanks for for the introduction. Um, you know, if if I had been speaking to uh, to you all from our home out in Marathon, I I might have expected technological glitches, uh, but I'm actually speaking from Austin, so um, I think it's my fault. <laughs> Where I wherever I go, technological glitches follow. But here we are together, and I'm happy about that. Uh, I'm happy that you and uh, our mutual friend Steve Davis have arranged uh, this, and, and I'm really uh, I'm impressed with what with what Lone Star College is doing with with this series. I, I think it, it it must be really worthwhile. What I thought I would do uh, is talk a little bit about how the book came about. Talk about. Uh, the writing and the reporting, you know, about how to pull together a book like this. Talk some about the issues that the book raises, both for me and and for its its readers, and then then we'll get into questions just as soon as we can. I thought I might also, John, if it's okay, read just a little bit from the book, um, and if. Uh, Buddy, the dog in the next room doesn't spot a squirrel outside and start barking, then we'll we'll plunge in. That's okay, Joe. My cat is sitting right next to me, and who knows when she starts <laughs> meowing. <laughs> okay. So 
On a fall afternoon in Austin uh, in 2017 at the Texas Book Festival, I was signing books, uh, signing a, a book that's a bit happier than, than this one, uh, a book called Hometown Texas about small towns around the state. And um, my daughter, Kate, happened to be in line. And when she got to me, she said, Dad, did you hear about the shooting? And I had not heard about it. And Kate didn't remember the name of the town. Um, and so one, she thought it might, might be uh, some little town close to San Antonio, but she wasn't sure. So when I finished with my book signing duties, got in the car and headed back toward Houston, turned on satellite radio and began to hear the horrific news about what had happened in a little town east of San Antonio called Sutherland Springs. You know, as part of my job, uh, I travel the state. I pride myself on knowing every small town in Texas. And, and when I was at the Washington Post, my colleagues would try to stump me, you know, ask me, where is Desdemona, Joe, or whatever. And I would usually know. But I had never heard of Sutherland Springs. But anyway, head, headed down I-35 towards San Antonio and then taking the loop east around the city. I eventually got to Sutherland Springs just as it got dark. I crossed Cibolo Creek, and once you cross the creek where the springs are, in fact, you're in Sutherland Springs. But normally, you don't really know it because there's not a, a traditional downtown. Uh, there's one flashing yellow stoplight, a couple of gas stations, the post office, and that's about it. On this evening, on this night, there were satellite trucks, there were, were floodlights, there were police cars, there were ambulances, there were rubberneckers, there were you know, crowds of people uh, everywhere. And across the street, across the road, across the highway from where I pulled up, there was a white frame, small, old, older church building. It was hard to imagine what I had heard about happening in that little building just a few hours earlier. So I found a place to park. I, I saw that there was some kind of candlelight vigil going on across the street. And I, I joined it and, and listened to a man delivering sort of a sermon uh, to a crowd gathered around him. I was standing there listening to him, looking at the people, looking at the, the circle of fellow journalists like me with our microphones and our notebooks, uh, almost crowding out the, um, the, the, the townspeople. I noticed uh, that I was standing beside a man in a wheelchair, a middle-aged, you know, gray-haired fellow in a wheelchair, and I was careful not to, to step in front of him so that he wouldn't be able to see. And I looked at him a second time and realized that I was standing next to Governor Abbott, who, to his credit, was not particularly taking part in what was going on, but was listening and holding up a candle. As I stood there and listened, somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and I thought, you know, maybe it was a photographer trying to get closer to the governor to get a photo. And I turned around, and it turned out to be my son, who at the time, uh, Pete was a reporter for the Washington Post, and he happened to be in Texas for a family reunion in Kerrville when he got the call to go to Sutherland Springs, Texas and cover what had happened. Um, so I hadn't seen him in a while, so there he was, the father and son covering this horrific story. He was also wearing, I noticed, a T-shirt that said, democracy dies in darkness across the chest. And I, was, I wanted to say, as, as dear old dad, Pete, is that the shirt you ought to be wearing in small town Texas? But I didn't. So we went on and covered the story, and I began listening to what had happened. A man, a young man, burst into a church service with a military-style weapon, begins spraying bullets, kills 26 people, wounds most of the others in the church. There were probably 50 in the church that morning. And it's as I, I couldn't comprehend 
not only what had happened in that building just across the road, but what had happened both to those people who were who lost their lives that morning, but also to those who didn't and those who were related to the people inside the church that morning. So after a while, I, I got back in the car and began driving to Houston, thinking about that story. And it reminded me of a book I had read years ago. It's, it's one of my sort of top 10 books in my life. It's called Everything in Its Path by a Yale sociologist named Kai Erickson. And it's about a flood in the early 70s that devastated this West Virginia community, uh, coal mining community. And um, what Erickson did was, was come in after the devastation, after the reporters had left, and he stuck around. And he wrote about the aftermath of this horrific tragedy. And um, that, that's what his book is about. It's, it's about not only everything in its, in its path, everything in the, the path of the flood, but everything that followed the flood for months and months afterward. And I decided that I would try to do something similar in this little Texas town that I'd never heard of. And I realized that maybe it would be possible for a couple of reasons. One is, I write about Texas towns, small towns and large, primarily small ones. So I, I sort of know the people. I write a column called Native Texan. I am a Native Texan, so I, I know I know my fellow Texans. My column readers don't always realize it, but I also write editorials, you know, unsigned editorials for the Houston Chronicle. Frequently, I write about guns. And uh, this was obviously a gun incident. And that word incident doesn't begin to describe what happened that morning. The other thing I realized when I was driving is that I grew up in a fundamentalist small town church like these people at Sutherland Springs, I thought. And so I sort of know I don't want to say the mentality, I guess the spirituality of these people and how important their religious belief is to their daily lives. I didn't know at the time how extremely important it is for the people of Southern Springs. So I went on back to Houston, put together a proposal. Uh, my agent found a publisher for me, and then I had to, had to decide how to write this book. Like most reporters, I don't like to walk up to somebody who's just experienced the most horrible thing one can imagine happening to them, stick my microphone or my notebook in their face and say, tell me what it was like to lose your child. Tell me what, what it was like to see your husband die as he's standing next to you in church. No reporter I know likes to do that. And yet, somehow, that's the information that you have to get as a reporter. So, I started driving to Sutherland Springs on Sundays and going to church with, uh, with the folks, uh, driving over Thursday evenings when they have Bible class and Thursday evening supper, and just you know, sort of getting to know the people and maybe just as important, allowing them to get to know me. And for the first few weeks when I was with them, I wouldn't take notes at the time. You know, I'd, I'd listen, 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 think about what they were telling me and then try to get it down from what I remember. Gradually, you know, I got to know them. They got to know me as this guy sort of hanging around. We're not quite sure why, but he's here and it seems to be harmless. So um, I would, after a while, that they realized I was writing a book and, and I began to take notes. One of those uh, Thursday evenings after Bible study and uh, as they were getting ready to eat, they got to talking about the reporters in their midst. 
most of us had left by then. I, I, was, I stuck around and the San Antonio Express News reporter, uh, Sylvia Foster Frau, stuck around and uh, a photographer from the Express News stayed. So as they were talking about the reporters they had gotten to know, I realized, and they laughed about it, that they had sort of a blacklist of reporters in whom they had lost trust. As I remember, People Magazine was on the list, uh, San Antonio TV station, uh, let's see, oh yeah, a, a documentary filmmaker from California who stuck around for a while. I didn't tell them that she was actually Nancy Pelosi's daughter, uh, but she, she was on their list as well. I didn't want to get on the list, but and as the pastor, Pastor Frank Pomeroy said, it's nothing personal, Joe. It's just that somehow we feel like they betrayed our trust. They got it wrong and didn't apologize, or they sensationalized the story, even though it's already sensational. And so anyway, I, I, I stayed with them and, and got to know the people. What I began to grapple with, the more Sundays I was with them, the more Thursday nights I, I was in their Bible classes, the more Sunday, you know, we, we'd go to, go to Sunday dinner at uh, a restaurant in Lavernia nearby. And I would have, they, by this time, they were beginning to tell me their story, their stories, their individual stories. And what I had trouble understanding is how they could accept what, happened to them with such equanimity or with such peace or just resignation. I couldn't figure out what the word is about how they were responding to what sounded to me like just unbearable pain and suffering. I think I realized at first that they were responding the way you and I would respond to just sort of a, a, a quick and facile, facile, facile question, the answer is the same way. How are you doing, John? I'm okay. John doesn't go into whatever, and they didn't either. You know, they didn't want to have to recreate for this intrusive reporter what had happened to them that Sunday morning. Gradually, they did. The more times I would come back and politely, I hope, intrude on their lives and on their experiences. Even then, even as they got into the details, I still had trouble believing them, believing that they, because of their faith, could accept what happened that morning and not be enraged at somebody, at God, at the shooter, at the law, at somebody. I was talking to my friend here in Austin, who uh, is head of the Jewish Studies Center, or was at the time, at the University of Texas, Robert Abzug, and, and Bob reminded me that um, Holocaust survivors often lost their faith. They could not imagine a God who would allow something like the Holocaust to happen. So that's what I expected, I guess. That's what I expected from the people of Sutherland Springs. But that's not the way they responded. Almost to a man or woman, they would tell me about how they believed that God had some kind of purpose for the event that happened on that Sunday morning and that their loved ones who died were in heaven rejoicing uh, in God's presence and waiting for their presence somewhere along the way. The minister's wife, Sherry Pomeroy, told me one time uh, she was making chocolate chip cookies for young people who are visiting from Michigan and helping some of the, um, the people who were 
were in wheelchairs after the shooting, helping them build ramps for their mobile homes and things of that sort. And she said, Joe, if we didn't, if we didn't have this belief, we couldn't go on. We couldn't carry on. And I, you know, I, I have to accept that as, as a fact. I was also impressed with, with the people I talked to uh, because despite their belief, they acknowledged that it was not easy and they were willing to accept help from psychologists and counselors and therapists who came out from San Antonio and stayed with them. They, they had access to these people from San Antonio from something called the Ecumenical Center uh, pretty much 24 hours a day whenever they needed it. And, and so they weren't denying the pain they felt, but they were looking for a justification, a rationale that made their lives worth living despite the death that had, had intruded in their lives. So, this might be a, you know, I, I, I try to avoid getting into uh, the gory details of what happened that Sunday morning, because it is all, almost unbearable uh, to think about. And yet, to understand some of these people and, and what they went through, it, maybe it's, it's useful for me to read just a little bit about what happened that, that morning. As, as you all remember, this 26-year-old fellow named Devin Patrick Kelly uh, arrives at the church uh, armed with military style weapons. He starts shooting from the outside through the walls. They don't know what's happening. Then he goes inside shooting to his right and his left as he walks uh, down the, the main aisle. Um, and as, as it, it finally, this horror finally comes to an end after about 11 minutes, there's a woman who was was a longtime member of the church named Julie Workman. She's in her mid early 50s, I guess. She's a nurse in San Antonio. And she's there with her two grown sons. And um, she watches her son, one of one of her sons, get shot, who's sitting there beside him. So here's here's what happens in the next couple of minutes. Uh, the, the sons are named Chris and Kyle. Um, they huddled under the pew next to their mother. Chris, thankful that his wife Colby and their daughter Evie weren't in church that morning. Julie looked over at her son, her talented musician's son, her stock car racing son. Her son, uh, Chris, is, is uh, the, the music director at the church. She looked him in the eye. She saw the barrel of the gun pointed at his back. She heard the shot. She screamed as she watched Chris get lifted off the floor by the force of the bullet and then fall back down. She held his hand. He was still alive. The gunman shot him again in the fleshy tissue of the hip. Are you okay? She asked. I can't feel my legs, he said. The shooter turned his attention to Julie, pointing the rifle toward her chest. No, she screamed to herself, just no. She was a breast cancer survivor and had undergone breast reconstruction surgery two weeks earlier. And now a stupid bullet was going to ruin that reconstruction. She was angry. The shooter pulled the trigger. She looked down at her chest, noticed she wasn't bleeding. She told herself, oh God, if, if that's all that taking a bullet feels like, it's nothing bad. Had the bullet glanced off? Did the shooter miss? She would never know. Afterward, she would tell people, I have wonder boobs. So over on the other side of this, this small church building uh, was a fellow named Gunny Macias. 
Gunny is 54 years old. He's a retired Marine gunnery sergeant. And when he heard the gunfire, he had he knew what it was, you know, given his his long years in the military in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. He, he immediately stood up. That's probably what saved his life because the bullets ripped through vital organs in the pelvic region instead of hitting him in the head or the chest. He slumped to the floor, blood pulsing from multiple wounds. Julie, as I mentioned, is a, is a nurse. So once she realized or she hoped the ordeal was over, she moved into nursing mode. Um, let's see. She hurried from one victim to another, starting with Carla Holcomb and checking for a pulse. The first seven people she approached were dead. She got to Brooke Ward. The five-year-old was beyond help. Julie began screaming. From several pews away, Gunny rose up. He was drenched in blood. Julie, he ordered, do your duty. Let me cry and scream over this baby, she said to herself, maybe to Gunny. Then I'll do what I'm trained to do. She went back to work. Twice more anguish overwhelmed her. Twice more Gunny rose up and ordered her back to work. Julie, do your duty. And she did. And saved several people, saved their lives. Gunny was grievously wounded. He, he lived, he's, he's still a member of the church. So there are countless stories like that that happened that Sunday morning in the little town of Sutherland Springs. The second thing, after I heard those stories and after I asked my intrusive questions was, how can you, given what you have experienced, tolerate guns around you? How can you tolerate living in a culture where, where guns are pervasive, ubiquitous, they're everywhere. And I was as surprised by their response to my gun question as I was to my response or to their response about uh, my, to my God question. The people of Sutherland Springs, and I suspect they're not unusual, are as devoted to their guns as they are to their God. As Julie herself reminded me, she has two guns at home. She has an AR-15 that she's never fired, but it's there. And she said something to the effect, you know, we live out in the country, we have to have our guns. And they do. Therapy at Brook Army Medical Center for, for some of the wounded was uh, going to a pistol range and, and shooting. And nobody I talked to even Julie's son, Chris, who was paralyzed from the waist down from being shot in the back, nobody suggested that we ought to change the law or that guns ought to be less available. I didn't argue with them, but as I would drive home in the evening after Sunday services and conversations about guns, um, I had trouble understanding how you could feel that way. But then you have to stop and think that the hero of that ordeal, if there is such a thing, was an NRA certified gun instructor, a self-described gun nut who had been around guns since he was, I think he said four years old. Stephen Williford is his name. And uh, he keeps, he keeps an arsenal of guns. I realize uh, in years past when, when you write about guns, particularly someone who's not all that familiar with them, you have to be very careful about getting the caliber correct, the type of gun correct, or the gun people who do know these things will make sure that, that will make sure to let you know that you got it wrong. So 
when I began writing about guns in the book, I scheduled sort of a tutorial with Stephen Williford to make sure that whatever I said was at least factually correct. So let me talk about Stephen a little bit. As I say, he, he was a, he's a gun expert and he has a guard, an arsenal of guns at home. And when he gave me his tutorial, he set me up in his living room and he would go back to a back room somewhere and bring out a gun. He would show it to me and he would say, Joe, is it loaded? No, Stephen. Um, and then he would describe what it was and they would have me hold it and always make sure that I'm pointing it down, not at anybody, not at him, not at me, not at anybody. So I learned whatever I learned from, from Stephen. But anyway, Stephen was not a member of the church, but he knew all of them. He knew most of the members because he, uh, he would play Santa Claus at their Christmas parties. He would drive a, a, uh, a hay wagon for hay rides at Halloween. So he knew them and they knew him. Stephen is also a retired plumber for a hospital in San Antonio, but he's on call uh, with this hospital in San Antonio. So he's, he's still working even though he's retired. On that Sunday morning, I, did I, I can't remember whether I said he's, he was not a member of the church, but he knows them. Uh, but anyway, on that Sunday morning, he's sleeping in late because he realizes that uh, he's going to have to go to work for 12 hours or so at the hospital that evening. His grown daughter lives with the Willifords, lives with her parents. And the daughter knocks on the bedroom door and says, Dad, I hear, I hear what sounds like gunshots. And she said, I'm going to go out and see what it is. So she gets in her car and drives toward the church. You can see the church from their house. It's just across the road. And then she came rushing back and she said, Dad, there's a fellow in black military style something shooting at the church. So Stephen gets out of bed, he pulls on a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, he's barefooted. He grabs one of his, one of his several AR-15s and a handful of bullets. And he walks outside, walks across the road and confronts the shooter from across the street and fires at him. The shooter has come out of the church building at that point to reload. He's wearing a bulletproof vest, but he's open on the side, you know, from the, the arm down. And Stephen, who has never fired at a human being, he, he used to like to fire at bowling pins, hits him in the side. And the shooter rushes to his SUV, climbs in and, and, and drives away. Had it not been for Stephen, it's arguable that the shooter would have gone back in to the church and would have finished off the rest of the congregation at that morning. So Stephen is a hero. When I talked to him, I talked to him numerous times. One, one time I was talking to him after church on a Sunday morning. And by then he had become something of a of a an expert around the country on church security. He was telling me about a conversation he had had with um, an elder at a large church in San Antonio, 5,000 members. Stephen's church had, uh, uh, the, uh, Southern Springs Church, Stephen then was not a member, but Southern Springs had 50 people. His church in San Antonio had 5,000. And Stephen was trying to persuade the elder that the church needed more security measures, whether it was armed elders in the lobby before services, locks on the doors, whatever Stephen would recommend. The elder told him, we don't believe in that kind of thing. We're an open church. We want to remain open to the world. Stephen looked at him and sort of shook his head, and he said, you know, half the congregation at Sutherland Springs died because security was, was lacking. If half your congregation of 5,000 died, would that be worth remaining an open church? 
Uh, Stephen, the, the answer, Stephen Williford, the, the answer was self-evident. Again, I, I didn't argue with him. I didn't argue with, with any members of the church where guns were ubiquitous. I, um, it, was, it was disconcerting at first to realize when you're standing or you're standing up singing the invitation song that at least a half dozen men in the congregation are armed. You can see the pistol on their belt. Pastor Frank Pomeroy wears a pistol on his hip in the pulpit. Guns are part, as I said earlier, guns are part of their life. In fact, Pastor Frank on that morning was in Oklahoma City qualifying for black powder shooting because he thought it would be something fun for kids at uh, summer Bible camp. Uh, so he, you know, he's, he's an ex-military man. Guns are important to him as well. If I were inclined to argue, you know, I would have to remind myself that they had been through something I certainly had ex hadn't experienced and didn't want to experience. Um, and so who am I to tell them how to respond to something like that? So Stephen is now a member of the church. Um, he set up a security team for the church so that there are people in the lobby who are kind of, if, if, you're, if you're a visitor, they're, they're kind of watching you to make sure that there's nothing out of the ordinary. Um, again, the, there are men in church services who are armed and Pastor Frank still has the pistol on his hip as well. Stephen became, Stephen Wilford became sort of an NRA hero and you can still watch YouTube um, presentations of, of his speech to his fellow NRA members. And you can see that, that uh, for him, he is the good guy with the gun who stopped the bad man. The trouble I had with it was somehow reconciling their Christian belief in the Prince of Peace with their fascination with a tool designed to kill their fellow human beings. And I still have trouble with it. And, and I, I have, in the, in the course of writing the book, have found other Christians, other Texas Baptists who look at it from a, another angle. So theirs is not necessarily the, the only way to consider guns and security, um, but it's certainly one you have to think about when you think about the experience they had. So here we are, let's see, three and a half years since the people of Sutherland Springs went through this horrific experience that took the lives of half their members. Since then, they have built or they have had built for them a large new sanctuary paid for by the Southern Baptist Convention. They have kept the old church where the shooting took place as a memorial to what happened. They still, they have chairs inside that, that little church where the victims were sitting. And their membership has probably quadrupled because people got to know them um, around the world after what happened to them and, and joined up with them. Pastor Frank um, ran for the state Senate against uh, State Senator Judith Zaffarini, you know, a, a veteran of, of, this, of the Texas legislature, he, he lost. Uh, Stephen Williford ran for Wilson County Commissioner, didn't make it out of the primary, which was interesting for the both of them because neither of them really talked about politics the whole time I was there. Um, but <laughs> I, I got the feeling that their notoriety uh, was something of a temptation to try to, to try to get involved in, in politics. It didn't quite work. Here we are. Um, oh, I, I should have mentioned also that as we speak, 
survivors and family members have been in court the last two weeks in San Antonio trying to persuade a federal judge that the federal government was responsible for the death of the deaths of their loved ones because when the shooter was in the air force he was involved in all kind of misdeeds including uh, uh, beating his wife his adopted son uh, gun misdeeds and ended up getting a dishonorable discharge and the air force the survivors argue should have contacted the federal gun registry so that this fellow could not have bought a gun uh, in Denver or in um, Selma outside of San Antonio, the guns he used in the shooting. Uh, the case has now gone to the judge who will make that decision in the next several weeks. I was hoping, I, I suppose, without really thinking it would happen, that the story of Sullivan Springs would be something of a history that it happened, but that nothing else like that would happen again. And during the pandemic, it seemed like that might be the case. Even though we didn't realize that shootings were going on, we didn't have the mass shootings, the spectacular shootings like Sutherland Springs or, or, all, or Las Vegas or all the others. But now, here we are again. They've started again. It's Boulder, Colorado, or Indianapolis, or Allen, Texas. They've started again. What that says about us as Americans, as Texans, as Texans who are, who, whose lawmakers are trying to make it even, make it even easier to acquire guns without a license. What that says about us, I don't know. I'm not sure what we can do about it. It, it reminds me though that, you know, I have, my, my daughter lives in, in a small town in England near Cambridge. Her kids can run around that town as they do without ever worrying about getting shot with a gun. The police in Ely, England, don't even carry weapons. And so there's, it's something about us that I don't understand, but I think it's a pathology that has to be explored, that can't be ignored, and that's one reason why I wrote the book. So, Joe, I'll ask the first question. This gives people time to type questions into the chat. Um, so, do you maintain contact with the people in Sutherland Springs? Are you there on a regular basis? Even no, I, today? I, hear, I hear from them now and then, but I'm not there on a regular basis. Okay. All right. Well, the first question is from Esmeralda, and she asks, uh, okay, yes. She said, could you, could you describe your feelings, your, the emotions you went through as you wrote the book? <laughs> this is book number six for me, and, and it's, it's the hardest book I've ever had to write, in part because I wanted to get it right. I mean, these people had been through enough without some journalists coming in and, and uh, not getting the story right. But I needed to hear those stories from people who experienced that horrific Sunday. I needed them to tell the story to me in detail. And I also began to realize, Esmeralda, that, that these were people who were members of that church almost, well, I shouldn't say almost, it is their family. And they had gathered together even before, long before the shooting as a source of sustenance. They had been through other difficulties in their personal lives, whether it was drug addiction or alcoholism or family troubles, whatever. But they, they found strength among themselves, among the congregation. So they would tell me those stories as well. And then, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, I'd be driving home, just thinking about what I had heard. And I would get home and I would sit down and try to ex 
try to re recount these stories to my wife, to Laura. And I couldn't get through them. I couldn't tell those stories because, you know, I was having to be the journalist taking down notes as they poured out their grief. I couldn't, you know, sometimes I would, sometimes I'd feel tears in my eyes as I was listening, but it, it was hard. Listen to those stories. I'm sure it was. The next question is from David, and he asked this. Can you describe how the story someone tells a reporter changes between a quick in the face Mike moment versus a more relationship, less trust based story? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's sort of like, David, sort of like uh, almost any story you tell as you get to know the person. Uh, and as the person gets to know what, what you're telling, you, you fill in the details and you dare share some things that you might not have shared. I, I remember that there's a fellow named David Colbath over there who got shot numerous times. He, the, the shooter was standing over him with his gun pointed at the back of his neck and he knew it was over. But somehow it wasn't. Somehow it wasn't. And, you know, he, he told me earlier about about some of those details of being shot. But then as, the more we talked, the more he began to describe how he was crawling under the pews from the back of the church to the front. And he was telling himself, and he, he was just saying these things like, I love you, Jesus. I love you. I can't remember his son's name, but everybody in his family, as he's crawling, he's, he's uttering these, what he thinks are his last words. And so those are details that come out later on. And I remember David uh, sent me a, 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 an audio tape that he made while he was sitting um, on a hotel balcony overlooking a Florida beach where he had gone to tell his story to a church. And he began just to sort of ruminate about that, that Sunday and life preceding that Sunday. And he wouldn't have told me that unless we had gotten yeah. to know each other over several months. Yeah. What do their stories tell you about human beings? This I'm listening to you talk. I wanted to ask you that. Uh, well, I, I guess I think about Sherry Pomeroy, the, the, the minister's wife, who said if we didn't have our belief, you know, we couldn't go on. Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, because they, they do go on. We all, most of the time, go on, whether we're members of the Southern Springs First Baptist Church or whether we just have to wake up in the morning after something, after we've had to experience something difficult and go on. So there's a lot of resiliency in people that maybe they didn't even know they, they had. Yeah. Okay, this question is from Steve Davis. Uh he says, one of the residents of the town you interviewed spoke of some, quote unquote, conspiracy idiots who appeared after the shootings. Could you tell us a little more about this episode and whether you were surprised that that happened? I was, I was surprised. They were surprised because it's so outlandish what happened. Um, Pastor Frank is at the church one afternoon and a middle aged couple drive up and confront him. He's out in the yard, the church yard, and they confront him, telling him that it didn't, what, what we have read about did not happen. His daughter, his 14 year old daughter, who was shot and killed, was not shot and killed, that she's off somewhere, it did not happen. And they are part of a conspiracy group a number of conspiracy groups who somehow either they believe what they're saying or they're trying to persuade others that it happened regardless of whether they believe it or not. Uh, as Pastor Frank is trying to figure out what to do with them, one of the elders drives up. And this is a fellow who has sort of a quick temper. He also has a gun on his hip. And so Pastor Frank is telling me that he's having to get between the elder 
and th this crazy couple because mm -hmm. he's not sure what the elder is going to do. Uh, as it turned out, the elder didn't do anything. The couple got arrested and they're in prison now. But um, the more I read about it, the more I realized that, you know, the, the QAnon types and, and others like them are all over this country and they happen to show up at Sutherland Springs. Well, uh, the next question from the audience asks you to comment on your study of the frontier, Texas, the history of the state uh -huh. in terms of God and guns. Yeah, that's that, that's an interesting question and one I, I try to deal with a little bit in the book because we, we Texans pride ourselves on taming a rough country, you know, in the 1800s and using guns to do it. And somehow that heritage has followed us into, uh, you know, into the 21st century where the guns that were used to tame the West, the Southwest, are not really, it seems to me, relevant to the urban lives we lead today. And yet, you know, it's, it's certainly part of, of what's happening in the legislature. It's, it's part of, of the misuse of guns. And um, I get stuck there. I, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with that. I, there, there's a part of the book um, where I write about Pastor Frank's hero, uh, this, this minister. He was uh, an itinerant evangelist out in West Texas. And, uh, you know, he would, he would go to San Angelo or wherever and hold services, maybe in a, in a bar because there wouldn't be any place else in town. And, uh, you know, as he, as he sort of set up behind the pulpit, he would make sure that, that his rifle was right there beside him so that there wouldn't be, be any disruption of the services. So there, uh, is, a, there is a heritage. Did you run across, uh, let's see, did you run across any atheists in the town and how did they cope with it if, if you did? <laughs> I didn't run across any atheists in the town. Um, it, as, as I say, it's a small town, it's working class, Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's the, 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 the church is sort of the center of town, and yet most, most members of the church don't live in Sutherland Springs. They come in from uh, Seguin or Stockdale mm -hmm. or Florida, yeah. and they're drawn by the sort of the charismatic uh, personality of Pastor Frank, I think, and, and by, as I was mentioning a while ago, by the sustenance they get from each other. But I, but John, I, I didn't run into the atheists. Okay, yeah. Um, this is uh, so. The final question is because our time is about up, and that is, what is your next book project? Well, let's say it's. I'm looking for something happier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm working on a book right at the moment about Texas in in the 1930s. Uh, uh, there, there were. Troubles in the 1930s, not quite as as traumatic or dramatic as, as this. So, yeah, see. I should tell the audience that Joe also wrote a book about uh, called Hurricane Season about the 2017 Astros and, of course, uh, Hurricane Harvey as well. And uh, yeah, a great book. So for the audience, the book is Sutherland Springs. Here it is. Uh, God, Guns, and Hope in a Texas Town. I would recommend this to all. And uh, thank you, Joe, for your time today. We're very grateful to you. And thank this, you, Joe. Uh, I appreciate it. This is the end of our series for the semester, and we hope you're back in the fall for uh, more authors. We've got them lined up already. Thanks, Joe. You bet. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.